Hello and welcome to GRB, which stands for Guy Reads Books. I'm your host, the guy reading books, and today we're going to be reading through Thomas Boston's A View on the Covenant of Works. Now, this is my first ever broadcast, and uh, while I might sound a little bit you know, professional because I have this new microphone, um, this is the first time I've ever done anything like this, and I'm illiterate to some extent, so that's part of why I'm reading books. Hopefully it can be a benefit to you, because you'll be able to listen to me read the books, but it's also so that I can learn how to read. Now, given that this is my first broadcast, as I've mentioned two times now, this is the third, that means that I don't actually know how to like edit videos and stuff, so you'll notice that there's no video feed, because I don't know how to add audio to a video feed. I also don't know how to like stop the audio feed, and then like make changes so that you can't hear the sound of me swallowing or scratching my nose. So you'll probably hear all of that stuff. Um, anyway, we're going to read. There's no outtakes. Um, I'm going to try and keep this preface short in each video, but my goal is to read through about 20 to 30 minutes of Thomas Boston's uh, A View of the Covenant of Works on each episode, so to speak. Uh, he doesn't really have very strong chapter breaks. I'd have to read for about two hours to get to one. And because of that, uh, we're just going to kind of chug on through. My hope is that at the end of the video, I'll just kind of pause it really briefly, give a little uh, reminder of where we are. And then from there, you'll be able to listen to the next episode. I'll try to do this about weekly, maybe a few times a week. And whoever wants to listen to it because they feel like, oh man, I too am illiterate. Or maybe you're in a situation where you, you're driving or something and you want to be able to study Thomas Boston or any of the other people I might read later on down the road. My hope is that you'll be able to use my uh, shaky and borderline illiterate voice to guide you through uh, the writings of some of these great authors from the past. Um, anyway, we're at about uh, five seconds over a minute now, so we're going to get into it. This is Thomas Boston's A View of the Covenant of Works, Episode 1. Um, I'm going to start with the preface here, written by his own son. Preface. Though the doctrines and precepts of Christianity are unalterable in their nature and must necessarily be the same in all ages and places, yet we find that the foolish caprice of men has made them appear in various shapes in different periods and countries. In the golden days of Christianity, before men had learned the art of making gain of godliness in a literal sense and contracted the ridiculous humor of modeling religion according to their re respective tastes and tempers, the religion of Jesus was then seen in its native simplicity, unadulterated with the unnatural additions and embellishments of human invention. In process of time, when it was found that religion was not unsubservient to worldly interests, some of its votaries, see, I'm illiterate, I don't know how to say these words, some of its votaries, inclining to make the kingdom of Christ resemble the kingdoms of this world, stripped religion in a great measure of its native unadorned simplicity and dressed it in garments of their own manufacture. This dangerous spirit of innovating, when it once begins, knows no bounds or limits. It is like a river or flood, whose current has been stopped when once it let loose, it will disregard its proper channel and carry everything down with its impetuous torrent. The rapid progress with which this wild spirit has made is clearly seen in those enormous corruptions which gradually crept into the Church of Rome, until at length she arrived at the monstrous absurdity of a wafer god created by the benediction of a priest. It had not, however, been so fatal to the interests of true religion if the inventions of men had been confined to circumstantials or things, oh, sorry, dropped my phone, which I'm reading off of. That's the uh, professionalness of this broadcast. Let's start that over again. It had not, however, been so fatal to the interests of true religion if the inventions of men had been confined to circumstantials or things of lesser importance. Had this been the case, the blessed religion of Jesus would not have so much reason to put on her widow's weeds. The Christian world was pleased to indulge some ingenious triflers in forming refined theories of, cre of the creation of all things, and was not offended whether they chose a volcano or a long-tailed comet for the instrument of dissolution. Nor has the Christian denied the same gracious indulgence to such of the same kidney as have tried to lash their lingering moments into speed by attempting curious calculations 
with respect to the prophecies in the book of the Revelation. Nor will he laugh, I am persuaded, when they outlive their calculations. A decent company will not readily quarrel with a conceited cook for garnishing the dishes with herbs that are not edible. But if he infuses these herbs into the sauce, everyone who regards his life and health will immediately take alarm and refuse to eat it. In like manner, the friends of Jesus, for the sake of peace, will be disposed to bear with men's foibles and humors when they are, comparatively speaking, harmless and do not alter the system or affect the essentials of our holy religion. But, on the other hand, if men take it into their heads to new model the system of Christianity and to prescribe a new plan of salvation, such criminal, liber criminal liberty can never be permitted, and those who regard the health and welfare of their souls will neither taste, relish, nor digest such poisonous, unwholesome food. That such attempts have been made, and with considerable success as well, the present state of the religious world is a sufficient proof. The rusty armor of Pelagius and Socinus, Socinus has with unparalleled affronty, affrontery has with unparalleled affrontery been buckled on, and the self flattering doctrines of Arminius have, with sanguine hopes of success, been furbished furbished up anew, have been furbished up anew. Hmm. As Pelagius took away original sin, another adventurer, determined not to be outdone by the arch heretic, at one blow rids us of actual transgression. Strange hypothesis. Sin, revelation as well as experience and fact tell us, has an actual existence in the world. There are only two kinds of it. Visibly, original, and actual. How then can any of these species of sin exist if man is guilty of neither? One could scarce believe that such chimeras as these would ever enter into men's heads, to whom the uncorrupted services of divine truth are accessible. But the truth is this. Men have generally formed such conceptions of the present state of human nature and the extent of its powers as they wish to be true, and wishing them to be true, have asserted them to be so, and after dressing her up in a gay attire of their own making, to complete her honor, and fix the crown of glory upon her head, have complacently enough given her salvation of her own working out. Hence it is that human merit and personal righteousness pass so currently in this refined age as the only conditions of our acceptance with God and justification in his sight. The success of this modern method of Christian making is easily accounted for, for as it ascribes the whole praise of his salvation to man himself, it is much more agreeable to the pride of the human heart than the gospel method of salvation, which resolves the whole into the free grace of God in Christ Jesus. But though such a scheme of salvation is greedily swallowed by the human heart, yet if it is not the sanctification... No, sorry, let me reread that sentence for you all. But though such a scheme of salvation is greedily swallowed by the human heart, yet if it has not the sanction of the infallible oracles of truth, it must be looked upon as, quote, a cunningly devised fable, end quote. Will such unscriptural principles as these, with respect to the way of access to the divine favor, are assiduously propagated by some and greedily swallowed by others, the following publication cannot be deemed as unseasonably one, as an unseasonably one. It turns upon a capital article in the Christian system, upon our notions of which all our views of the method of acceptance with God must depend. For if one man maintains that human nature, by proper culture and improvement, may acquire strength and integrity equal to that which it had in the days of primeval rectitude, salvation by works will to him appear quite practicable. But on the other hand, if another man, according to sacred writ, believes that the descendants of Adam are obnoxious to the curse of the law and, quote, dead in their trespasses and sins, end quote, he will clearly see the necessity of Christ's satisfaction to remove the one and the power of the Spirit to raise from the other. As the following sheets, therefore, are designed to give us the scriptural account of the original transaction between God and the first parent of the human race, to express the nature and extent of the effects of the fall, and consequently to lead us to right conceptions of the method of salvation prescribed in the gospel, they will not, this editor fondly hopes, be an unacceptable offering to the public. As to the performance itself, the reader, when it comes into his hand, must judge of its merit. 
To attempt a character of it would be too delicate a task for the pen of so near a relation as the author's own grandson. So here I misspoke. I thought it was his son. It's actually his grandson. This is why we read. He only begs leave to inform the public that the work is genuine and is printed from the author's manuscript without any alterations or additions, but such as are merely verbal and do not affect the sense. It was preached in a course of sermons to his own congregation by the worthy author, Thomas Boston, in the latter end of the year 1721 and in the beginning of the year 1722. And it appears from the following paragraph, extracted from his diary, that he was led to undertake the subject on account of the controversy agitated before several general assemblies of this national church concerning a book entitled The Marrow of Modern Divinity. Quote, I was now led, end quote, says the author, Thomas Boston, quote, from my ordinary to treat of the two covenants, which lasted a long time. I began on the covenant of works, August 27th of the year 1721, and handling it at large from several texts, I insisted thereon till May in the following year. I studied it with considerable earnestness and application, being prompted thereto as to the close consideration of the other covenant as well, afterwards by the state of the doctrine in this church was then arrived at. End quote. Thomas Boston. The author here alludes to the controversy above mentioned. The editor did not think himself at liberty to change its original form of sermons. He has, however, for the ease of the reader, divided the treatise into parts, and added general titles to them, as well as to the subdivisions of each part, which he thought himself sufficiently warranted to do, as the author himself has followed the same method in his view of the covenant of grace. The reader will find in the book several references to the celebrated Dr. Witsius's Economy of the Covenants, which, though they are not in the original manuscript, the editor has added, with a view of referring to the reader to that great work for a further illustration of some of the subjects of this essay. It would be unnecessary to offer the public the reasons why this performance remains so long in manuscript, or why it now emerges from its obscurity so long after its reverend author's death. Readers of a certain class will perhaps think that it has come to light soon enough, and those of another complexion will not relish it less because they have wanted it for so long. It now ventures out an orphan into the world, and as some of the same family, the fourfold state, etc., have met with a candid reception from the public, the orphan hopes, even under the disadvantages common to posthumous publications, that it will meet with some regard for its parents' sake. Michael Boston. So before we get into part one here, this is uh, your host, Guy, breathing books. Um, just a couple of notes. Um, I will basically be reading verbatim what I what is here. This is the Monergism copy of the book. You can go on monergism.com and download it. Most of what I hope to read on this channel, if this actually ends up taking off, is going to be from monergism.com. That way you can follow along. Um, the reason for this is because, as I mentioned before, and as you probably found out by now if you're still listening, I am illiterate to the extent that there are a lot of words that when I see them, I don't know what they mean. And to some extent, that might be because these words are kind of extinct now. Um, to another extent, it's just because I'm dumb. And I ask you to be patient with me. I'm not getting paid to do this. I don't hope to ever get paid to do this. But I do hope that it can be encouraging to you, that it can be encouraging to me, as I'm also going to be reading this for the first time. And uh, I could take time to really polish these and to take out all of my misspeaking and my breathing and things like this, but um, I've actually been trying to do this mentally for a couple of months now, and I think that if I had taken the time to do those sorts of things and to try and uh, prepare this in a well-polished manner, I would just end up never doing it at all. So as you've probably heard before, don't let the enemy, uh, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the mediocre. That's my take on that. So all right, that being said, let's get into the actual substance of the book, starting with part one. Uh, here we go. Genesis 2.17 But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Introduction My design is, under the divine conduct, to open up unto you the two covenants of works and grace, and that because in the knowledge and right application of them the work of our salvation lies, the first covenant showing us our lost state, 
and the second holding forth the remedy in Christ Jesus, the two things which, for the salvation of souls, I have always thought it necessary chiefly to inculcate. And I think it the more necessary to treat of these subjects, that, in these our declining days, the nature of both these covenants is so much perverted by some, and still like to be more so. And as I desire to lay a good foundation among you, while I have opportunity, so I entreat all of you, and particularly the younger sort, to hearken and hear for the time to come. I begin with the first covenant to show the nature of it from this text. But of the tree of knowledge, and then he ends the quote there, so that's all you get. In which words we have an account of the original transaction between God and our first father Adam in paradise, while yet in the state of primitive integrity, in which the following things are to be remarked, being partly expressed and partly implied. Number one, the Lord's making over to Adam a benefit by way of conditional promise, which made the benefit a debt upon the performing of the condition. This promise is a promise of life and is included in the threatening of death. Thus, if thou eat not of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt live. Even as it is in the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill, is plainly implied, thou shalt preserve thy own life and the life of others. And thus it is explained by Moses, Romans 10.5, The man which doth those things shall live by them. Besides, the license given to him to eat of all of the other trees, and so of the tree of life, which had sacramental use, imports this promise. Number two, the condition required to entitle him to this benefit, namely obedience. It is expressed in a, in a prohibition of one particular. Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. There was a twofold law given to Adam. The natural law, which was consecrated with him, engraven on his heart and his creation, for it is said, Genesis 1.27, that, quote, God created man in his own image, end quote, compared with Ephesians 4.24, quote, that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, end quote. This law was afterwards prom promulgated on Mount Sinai, being much obliterated by sin. Another law was the symbolic law mentioned in the text, which, not being known by nature's light, was revealed to Adam probably by an audible voice. By this God chose to try, and by an external action, exemplify his obedience to the natural law, concreated with him. And this being a thing in its own nature altogether indifferent, the binding of it upon him by the mere will of the divine lawgiver did clearly import the more strong tie of the natural law upon him in all of the parts of it. Thus, perfect obedience was the condition of this covenant. Number three, the sanction or penalty in the case of the breaching of the covenant, quote, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die, end quote. For if death was entailed on a doing of that which was only evil, because it was forbidden, much more might Adam understand it to be entailed on his doing of anything forbidden because evil, or contrary to the nature or will of God, the knowledge of which was impressed on his mind in his creation. The sanction is plainly expressed, not the promise, because the last was plain, plainly enough signified to him in the tree of life, and he had ample discoveries of God's goodness and bounty, but none of his justice, at least to himself. And it does not appear that the angels were yet fallen, or if they were, that Adam knew of it. Number four. Adam's going into the proposal and acceptance of those terms is sufficiently intimated to us by his objecting nothing against it. Thus the Spirit of God teaches us Jonah's repentance and yielding at length to the Lord after a long struggle, chapter 4, verse 11, as also Adam's own going into the covenant of grace, Genesis 3, 15. Besides, his knowledge could not but represent to him how beneficial a treaty this was. His upright will could not but comply with what a bountiful God had laid upon him, and he, by virtue of that treaty, claimed the privilege of eating the other trees. And so, of the tree of life, as appears from Eve's words in Genesis 3, verse 3, quote, But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. End quote. Now it is true, we have not here the word covenant, yet we must not hence infer that there is no covenant in this passage, more than we may deny the doctrine of the Trinity and sacraments, because those words do not occur where these things are treated of in Scripture, nay, are not to be found in the Scripture at all. But as in those cases, so here we have the thing, 
for making over of a benefit to one upon a condition with a penalty gone into by the party that is proposed to, that is a covenant, a proper covenant, call it as you will. The covenant of works between God, Adam, a proper covenant. The truth deductible from these words are this. The truth deductible from the words is this, my bad. There was a covenant of works, a proper covenant, between God and Adam, the father of mankind. In handling this important point, I shall, first, confirm the great truth expressed in the doctrinal note, and evince the being of such a covenant. I will, second, explain the nature of this covenant, and third, I will conclude with practical uses. The truth of the covenant of works confirmed. Number one, I shall confirm this great truth and evince the, be the being of. So I shall confirm this great truth and evince the being of such a covenant. It is altogether denied by the Arminians that there was any such covenant, and amongst ourselves by Professor si Simpson, that it was a proper covenant. The weight of this matter lies here. That if the covenant was made with Adam. If the covenant that was made with Adam was not a proper covenant, he could not be a proper representative head. And if he was not, then there cannot be a proper imputation of Adam's sin unto his posterity. None could ever dream, but there must be a manifest difference between covenants between God and man, and those between men and men. There is no manner of equality betwixt God and man. God could require all duty of men without any covenant. Yea, and they have nothing but what is from him, and so owe it to him. But those things do not hinder that upon God's condescending to enter into covenant with man, there may be a proper covenant between them. Though all similitudes here must halt, yet let us suppose a father to propose to his son that if he will obey his orders, and especially in one point give him punctual obedience, for instance, laboring in his vineyard, he will give him a certain sum of money, and the son, having nothing to labor it with, the father furnishes him with all of the things necessary thereto. The son accepts of this proposal. Can any man say that there is not a proper bargain or covenant in this case between the father and his son, although the son was tied by the bond of nature to obey his father's commands and all this antecedency, antecedently to the bargain? Hmm. And though he has nothing to labor it with, but what he has from the father... Let him perform his father's orders now according to the covenant, and he can challenge the sum as a debt, which he could not do before. For proof of this, consider, number one, here is a concurrence of all that is necessary to constitute a true and proper covenant of works. The parties contracting, God and man. God requiring obedience as the condition of life, a penalty fixed in case of breaking, and man acqu acquiescing in the proposal. The force of this cannot be evaded by comparing it with the, con with the consent of subjects to the law of an absolute prince. For such a law proposed by a prince, promising a reward upon obedience to it, is indeed the proposing of a covenant, the which the subject, the which the subject consenting to for himself and his, and taking on him to obey, does indeed enter into a covenant with the prince, and having obeyed the law, may claim the reward by virtue of paction. And so the covenant of works is ordinarily in scripture called the law, being in its own nature a pactional law. Number two, it is expressly called a covenant in scripture, Galatians 4, 2. Quote, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, etc. This covenant from Mount Sinai was the covenant of works as being opposed to the covenant of grace, namely the law of the Ten Commandments, with the promise and sanction, as before, expressed. At Sinai it was renewed indeed, but that was not its first appearance in the world. For there being but two ways of life to be found in Scripture, one by works, the other by grace, the latter hath no place, but where the first is rendered ineffectual. Therefore the covenant of works was before the covenant of grace in the world. Yet the covenant of grace was promulgated quickly after Adam's fall. Therefore the covenant of works behoved to have been made with him before. And how can one imagine a covenant of works set before poor, impotent sinners if there had not been such a covenant with man in his state of integrity? Hosea 6, 7 says, quote, But as for them, like Adam, they have transgressed the covenant. End quote. Our translators set the word Adam on the margin. 
but in Job 31.33, they translate the very same word, quote, as Adam, end quote. The word occurs but three times in Scripture, and still in the same sense. Job 31.33, quote, If I covered my transgressions as Adam, end quote. Psalm 82.7, quote, But ye shall die like Adam, end quote. Compare verse 6, quote, I have said, ye are gods, and of all of you are children of the Most High, end quote. Compared with Luke 3.38, quote, Adam, which was the son of God, end quote. And also here, Hosea 6.7, while Adam's hiding his sin and his death are made an example, how natural it is that his transgression that led the way to all be made so too. This is the proper and literal sense of the words. It is so read by several, and it is certainly the meaning of it. Number three, we find the law of works opposed to the law of faith. Romans 3.27 where is boasting then? Sorry, Romans 3.27, begin quote. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith, end quote. This law of works is the covenant of works, requiring works or obedience as the condition pleadable for life. For otherwise, the law, as a rule of life, requires works too. Again, it is a law that does not exclude boasting, which is the very nature of the covenant of works that makes the reward to be of debt. And further, the law of faith is the covenant of grace. Therefore, the law of works is the covenant of works. So Romans 6.14, quote, Ye are not under the law, but under grace, end quote. And this was the way of life without question, which was given to Adam at first. Number four, there were sacramental signs and seals of this transaction in paradise. As it had pleased the Lord still to deal with man in the way of a covenant, so to append seals to these covenants. God's covenant with Noah, that he would not destroy the earth again with water, had the rainbow as a sign of it to confirm it, Genesis 9, 12, and 13. The covenant with Abraham had circumcision, that with the Israelites, circumcision in the Passover, and the new covenant with the New Testament church, baptism, and the Lord's Supper. So to the covenant of works, God appended the two trees, the tree of life, Genesis 3, 22, quote, and now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever, end quote, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, mentioned in the words of the text. When we find them confirming seals of this transaction, when we find then confirming seals of this transaction, we must own it to be a covenant. Number five. Lastly, all mankind are by nature under the guilt of Adam's first sin. Romans 5.12, quote, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. End quote. And they are under the curse of the law before they had committed actual sin. Hence they are said to be, quote, by nature children of wrath, end quote. Ephesians, Ephesians 2 3. Which they must needs owe to Adam's sin as imputed to them. This must he this must he owing to a particular relation betwixt them and him which must either be that he is their natural head simply, from whence they derive their natural being, but then the sins of our immediate parents, and all other immediate ones too, behove to be imputed rather than Adam's, because our relation to them is nearer, or because he is our federal head also, representing us in the first covenant. And that is the truth, and evidences the covenant of works made with Adam to have been a proper covenant. Okay, um... I think we're going to stop here. This has been uh, a nice little bit of time. I've gotten to know you all very well. Hopefully uh, you found some of this to be encouraging. There were certainly things there that I feel like I learned from, so I appreciate Reverend Boston's work here. I'm not sure if he likes to be called Reverend, but probably maybe he's a Reverend author. That's what it says in the book, so I can only assume that if his grandson called him that, I can probably call him that as well. I appreciate your patience with me. I hope that uh, you were able to learn from this in spite of me and my works. And I hope that, uh, really, I hope you were able to focus on this. I hope this was able to be a blessing to you. I think that, uh, I think that the covenants, specifically the covenant of works and the covenant of grace, I think that they are, uh, maybe easy to learn of at first and then hard to master. It's really hard to get a uh, really good, solid understanding of them so that as we read scripture, um, we can understand, um, how, 
uh, the Puritans and those in church history in ages past have faithfully understood those things as they're reading the Bible. So I hope that as we read through this, as you listen, uh, while we look at what uh, Thomas Boston wrote here, I hope it's encouraging to you. I hope that you learn from it, and I hope that maybe you're able to faithfully uh, teach others uh, as Thomas Boston is faithfully teaching us. So thanks for listening. We will pick up with the nature of the covenant of works next, which is his second of three things that he promised us he would tell us about. So thank you. This has been Guy Reading Books, um, reading Thomas Boston's The Covenant of Works, end of part one.